Hi everyone, I'm Cindy here and today I'm with Marcus. We are both the chiropractors here at Prevolution Health and today I'm going to be talking to Marcus about men's health. It is a uh, type of care that he looks at more closely than I do and we'll be talking about the importance of both physical and mental health um, in healthcare. So Marcus, as a chiropractor, you must have seen hundreds if not thousands of men who've come through the practice who were forced pretty much by their wives for an appointment and they were pretty quite apprehensive to have the appointment. Why do you think this is the case? Well, firstly, it's absolutely true. I, every single week, have a, a male client come in and the male client invariably says that they're here because their wife made them come and they probably wouldn't have come without that type of direction. And that is, I think, an important recognition to make that Males are often more reluctant, if not resistant, to do things about their body than the much more wiser female <laughs> of our species. And I think it's principally because males for so long have had a focus and emphasis on we've just got to get stuff done. Uh, we go to work and we push through. There's the psychology of in men of pushing through. They, they go to work and if they're sore, it's alright, they can push through. And if they hurt themselves, they'll keep working because they can push through. And as every week, as I said, I have a conversation like this. And oftentimes the conversation ends with, and again, if I'm, if I'm generally honest, it's, okay, what do we need to do so that you feel comfortable, so that you feel confident, and so that you can say to your wife that you've been, and job's done. Mm -hmm. They're like, just get me out of here as quick as possible. And that's the experience that I have. Not irregularly, in fact, commonly. And as to why, as I said, males push through. But what I want to comment on in relation, because I think it's a great question, Dr. Cindy, is that the consequences that, of that approach. The more you push through, the more you neglect, ignore what is taking place in the body and the impact it is having, the worse it is going to get over time. I always like the analogy of you know, the, the engine light in the car. So, when you're driving along and the red warning light comes on saying there's an engine problem or an oil problem, you don't grab a hammer and smash the glass so you can't see the red warning light. You don't pull a fuse so the red warning light goes off. Or you don't put masking tape over the top of it so you're no longer alerted to the red warning light. And that's important because nobody would do that to their car, particularly if they have a really expensive car. But we do that to our body. We push through or we ignore or we put up with signs and symptoms and pain and problems. And the consequences and impact of that is just like if you ignore the red warning light in the car, the engine is going to blow. Well, the disc may blow, the back may go out. And all of that leads to what we commonly see after the husband gets dragged in, kicking and screaming, not wanting to be there, which is the problem becoming a greater problem later on because it is ignored, it is neglected. And as much as this is a common occurrence in men's health, it doesn't need to be, it in fact shouldn't be, I'm going to implore you to take greater and higher levels of personal responsibility for your health so that you can lead your family, lead your career, uh, and lead your life the way that you know is better. I love that analogy, Marcus. Could you possibly further elaborate on why both physical and mental health should be a priority though? Yeah, absolutely. Look, physical health has to be a priority. There's, you know, your health is in fact your greatest asset. And what that means is if, imagine for a moment, and you know, in today's day and age, and Cindy, you would have seen this more in your career, when I first graduated, 80% of people, there was a, a parent at home. And now that statistic has changed where maybe there are 20% of people where there is a parent at home, uh, families, not people. And the implication is that there was always someone there supporting the family, but certainly today that is less so um, due to economic and uh, particular economic reasons, but also cultural um, changes that have taken place within our society. What's really interesting is if you are generating income for the, for the family, if you are working and oftentimes we push through, imagine for a moment that you can no longer do your job, you can no longer support your family, you can no longer do your hobbies, your recreations or, or the sports or things that you enjoy and the impact that that has on people's, not just their health because their health is impacting that it's the quality of life, it's the, the joy that you have, the, the fun that you have, the engagement that you have, and the experiences that make your life meaningful. 
And what happens when we ignore our pain for long enough? It sends you a message. Pain is the first message and the messages get louder and more clear over time that you can't ignore this any longer. And when you do ignore it, when you no longer focus on um, you know, over pushing through and overcoming the problems that are there, the body puts you flat on your back so that you now know that there are choices you have to make and changes that you have to make as well. And I think the consequences of ignoring those symptoms, particularly in men's situations, oftentimes we see it with a lower back, a disc injury, and inevitably, they're out of work for a week, sometimes a month, and the impact of that is not only financial, but it's relational, it's, it's happiness, it's joy, it's capacity to live and to thrive and to experience the fullness of life. So when we push through, we inevitably push the symptom under until it comes up, you know, it gives a bit of a hit on the head and say, you've not been behaving well, and the consequences are not ones we should have to face. And the consequences are definitely real too. So speaking of symptoms, Besides the most obvious and uh, common symptom, which is pain, what are some of the uh, signs and symptoms you believe men should look out for and should factor in when they're considering when to see a health practitioner? Yeah, I think men, men's health is not absent of normal everyday health. And well, women can see this, men see this as well, but the most common things we will see in men particularly, and it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, a a job where there's a lot of physical demand mm -hmm. or whether it is a job with mental demand mm -hmm. um, so the difference between physical jobs and, and desk based jobs we still see lower back pain issues with them uh, we still see neck pain headache as, as very common and they're things that I think most people realize and know and understand but if you are having restless legs in the evening if you are having to move your legs all the time with that restlessness, you know there's probably going to be a disc involvement there. If you have aching legs, if you have difficulty you know, getting up in the morning and there's no mobility, you know that there's something wrong. If you're always going to try to move the neck, then we've probably got some changes that are happening in there from a you know, degenerative basis that's worth looking at. But from a men's health perspective, uh, we, we need to start being aware of you know, factors that are unique to men. So if you're getting up in the middle of the night on a regular basis um, to go to the toilet, that's something that tells us there are, there are challenges happening potentially with the prostate. If you are finding, and it's an interesting, more common, and I apologize we're on camera talking about sensitive subjects like your poo, but if you start getting more regular bouts of diarrhea and, and, and you know, more um, loose stools as we call them, then it's not uncommon to note that there is digestive things happening in males as well. Um, sharp pains around the liver area, particularly for those who either eat a lot of rich food or drink alcohol, we can start to think there are liver involvement um, in that situation. So men's health is normal physical health, except for the fact that there are things oftentimes more common in men, such as liver, prostate and bowel issues that need to be addressed, that need to be looked at. And then finally, probably the big one is, is blood pressure, um, particularly if you've got weight gain and you're in a high pressure, high stress job. If you're noticing heart palpitations, if you're noticing shortness of breath, if you have pain traveling down the arm, then this is something that needs to be looked at and addressed. And uh, it's an imperative that you take good care of yourself now and understand the signs and symptoms you experience in your body, the messages that are there are there for a reason and they can't be ignored, they should not be neglected. And then when you act upon them, you have better health now and for your future which is about thriving in life, not just surviving. So if you're listening, you just had all those signs of symptoms, whether you're a male or female, please seek help. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Marcus, to touch the finish off, I know giving one piece of advice is quite hard, but if you were to pick one piece of advice to give to men about their health, what would it be? Well, obviously there are many different dynamics to relationships, and I, I would suggest uh, probably the, as a husband, as a father, as a male, um, one of the proudest moments in my life that reduced my stressors, because stress I think is probably the biggest factor yeah. that males um, take on, it's the ability to be a better listener and be more responsive um, so that we're not putting stresses on ourselves. So the proudest moment comes, um, and. I'm going to put my hand up and say I was not always the best communicator. I was not always uh, particularly aware and grew up in a Southern European household that was quite stoic and didn't always um, listen 
to the needs of the people around them. So acknowledging where we come from. But I was walking with my wife uh, and we were just walking around the block. We, we live out of town a little bit so we can go for a walk out through nature. And she said something stupid. Now, I did that deliberately, by the way. Now, if you have that thought that somebody says something stupid, you're in a world of trouble, okay? Males, listen to me. You can't say that. But, hands up, I was guilty, okay? She said something stupid. And of course, my response was, why on earth would you say that? That was just stupid. And now, when somebody has a frustration, when somebody's in a point of pain, emotionally or otherwise, and they call for help. Sometimes the call for help is an attack. You're an idiot. You're silly. Isn't actually about you. It's their call for help saying they need some support and assistance. So Hannah said something that I would put on as being really silly. And I called her out on it. And of course, when somebody's angry, when somebody's stressed, and you call them out on it, what's the natural response? No, you're silly. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't just you're silly. It was like this big angry response and of course I was a little bit more calm and I did the absolute worst thing you could possibly do I said take a look at yourself you're overreacting now which when somebody's quite angry adds fuel to the fire and well it exploded the proudest moment come shortly after that where I realized I'm not helping the situation I am now part of the problem and so I reached over and I gave her a hug and she's like, don't hug me, you're in the bad books now. <laughs> I said, and I'm not letting go until you forgive me. I said, I'm sorry, I forgot that you're an angel and that you would never mean to say anything hurtful. Please forgive me. I'm not letting go. Finally, she melted. And this is many, many years ago. And I remember realising that as a husband, the best thing I can do is recognise and realise it is far better to be happy than right. They say happy wife, happy life. <laughs> well, they say that if only the opposite were not true, because it's not happy wife, happy life, unhappy wife, unhappy life. It's unhappy wife, miserable, deplorable, unexperienceable, <laughs> unmanageable life. So it's not an equal equation. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't joke like that, ladies. I do apologise. Uh, but in that moment, coming back, not joking in all seriousness, was realising that when I took responsibility for my own actions, my own states, my own emotions, and didn't need to be as reactive. One, that helps your heart health, it reduces your stress, it reduces therefore your blood pressure. It strengthens your immune system and puts your body in a healthier and better state. But ultimately what I did, it meant better relationships and better communication. So if I had one suggestion for, men, for men's health and for males is to actually do something that we're not taught to do and in fact almost discouraged to do and that's actually become more sensitive be in touch with the emotions um, be honest with our own emotional state and reflect upon the emotions of others so that we can better support them serve them meet our own needs simultaneously while being in a better state emotionally and it makes life happier makes life healthier and then we don't have to be those stoic people that just push through our pain and, and just <laughs> get over it and get on with it because that doesn't help it is actually starting to be more, ca more capable of thinking about our lives, how we are in our lives, what our needs are within our lives, communicating those, expressing that well. And that allows us that sensitivity to be more in tune with our body. And then from that place of attunement, listen to, acknowledge and act on, you know, not only what's happening in our body, but what's happening in our lives so that we are happier, we are healthier, we live better lives, and then we can thrive and experience an extraordinary and incredible and amazing quality of life. And I think that's a true gift. It is, and everyone deserves it. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that story of you and Hannah. But um, what you, I can't help but think when you spoke about how it's you don't want to be that stoic, grumpy man, but sometimes I, I've heard people say it's because I don't want to be selfish. I'm so selfless, I'm to sacrifice. But really, when the consequences are come, which the consequences are real, it then becomes, well, in some way, one way or another, to some extent, selfish the previous actions yeah it's interesting and I know we came to the end there yeah. and that, was, that wasn't ending but I'm going to hopefully add a little bit more value here with the thought because I, I think there is a difference between selfishness self-interest um, and selflessness yes so 
when you have selflessness, it's all about somebody else. You go to work uh, because you want to earn the money to put food on the table, to pay the mortgage, to put the kids through school, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. So there's that selflessness. And we, we all as parents have a degree of that. There is also selfishness, which is, it's all about me. I don't care about, as a male, the wife or the, or the partner. I don't care about the children. I just care about me. And I'm, if you've got problems, you deal with them. I'm going off to golf. You got problems? No, I don't care. That's your issues. I'm going heading down um, to the club. Whatever the case might be. That's a selfishness that is not going to help the relationship, nor is it going to help your health long term. In the middle between selflessness and self interest, uh, self, self selfishness and selflessness mm -hmm. is self interest. Self interest says, "I'll take care of me for you, yeah. and I will take care of me so I can take care of my family." And that does mean taking time out for rest, relaxation, time for exercise, having your own hobbies and having your own interests. And that means that we can create a life that is better by recognizing when we take care of ourselves, we have the capacity then to take care of others. And that's why we don't ignore the pain. That's why we don't take on that stoic process. Because if we end up six weeks in lying down on a bed because we've got a disc injury, we're not, taking, we're not paying the mortgage. We're not meeting the financial needs of the, the family. We're not looking after the kids and we're certainly not getting to work. So we've neglected and ignored our physical body at a significant consequence. And the, again, using a story and analogy, and you'll, you'll all be familiar if you have flown on planes that you know, the, the, the stewardesses and the stewards uh, in the aisle um, say, you know, in a case of emergency, a mask will fall down. And if you're traveling with children, please put the mask on, who first? And let you think about that. <laughs> who do you put the mask on first? Dr. Cindy? For yourself first. Really? Yep. Are you sure? Yep. What happens if you're traveling with children? They might not make it through. Well, they may pass out, but they won't die. Interesting. <laughs> so I've actually interviewed many pilots about this and what takes place when they do these um, role play scenarios, uh, it's really quite fascinating. Um, you have 15 seconds of depressurization at 30,000 feet before you're unconscious. Mm -hmm. So 10, 15 seconds before you're unconscious. This is what tends to happen. The mask drops down. There's initial panic. You don't act for the first three, four, five seconds. And then people are directing you. And then if you're traveling with a child, here's the statistics. 80% of women put the mask on the child first. 80% of men, guys, maybe we're smart or maybe we're selfish, I'm not sure, put the mask on ourselves first. So the firstly, women tend to give more than male um, of themselves. Yeah. And that's an interesting phenomenon. But we put the mask on the children, in most cases, females first. And what happens is, if you're with two children, five seconds putting a mask here, five seconds mask there, the five seconds of, of shock and panic, the mother goes unconscious, or the 20% of males um, who put the mask on the children first go unconscious, and the children can't mask the parents, so they may not make it through that depressurization process. But this is the point. If you put the mask on yourself first, the children may be unconscious, the second, the second child may be unconscious before you get to them, but the self-inflating mask means you get them the opportunity to re-inflate and then bring them back to consciousness. But it only happened because you took care of yourself first so you can take care of others. So self-interest is taking care of yourself to be able to take care of others. And I think it's a really important life lesson for all of us. And men in particular, we don't have to just push through. We can be willing to have that vulnerability to take care of ourselves and recognise that is a way of taking care of our families. Marcus, you never only add just a little bit of value. You always add a lot of value. I'm really grateful for your time here to talk about men's health and for sharing. Thank you. You're welcome.